if you have uh, a, a piece of metal, uh, not all materials behave as well as others, but some special materials. If uh, across the uh, metal, you have a temperature difference, so here's the hot zone and here's the cold zone, then a voltage will develop. And why does that happen? It happens because the density of electrons is different for the hot and the cold region. And because the density of electrons is different, you get a dipole moment established between the two ends, and that is the, the origin of the voltage. So uh, the quantity that's, that measures that, that voltage difference, here is the voltage difference divided by the temperature difference, is called the Zabeck coefficient. If you want to make a device and capture that energy, you need two things. You need a large Zabeck coefficient. So this is capturing this temperature difference. You want to capture that electrically. But you want the two uh, ends of, of this bar to stay at this te large temperature difference. So that means that you want the thermal uh, conductivity between these to be very, very small so that this temperature difference is not destroyed, but remains large. So that's the physical uh, reasoning behind the, this so-called figure of merit, ZT. So here's the Zabeck coefficient. We have to collect the electrons, the carriers of the energy. Uh, uh, so that's sigma, electrical conductivity. And then we have in the denominator, we want the thermal conductivity to be uh, uh, very uh, uh, small. So uh, uh, this is the quotient, ZT. And so how do we do this? And that's what my talk is going to be about. Uh, we have to have some kind of, of, uh, of approach. So thermal, thermal electricity is interesting. And uh, the, the origin, the uh, history, uh, was that people put in um, effort in the 1990s, 20 years ago. This field took a big uh, uh, spurt forward because people wanted to have uh, submarines being very, very quiet. That was the stimulus of this whole thing. And it was the US Navy and the French Navy that decided to put money into this and get people excited. So it had a military purpose. It wasn't to uh, collect waste energy. But I think that for societal benefit, that's what we're really looking for uh, in the long run. So OK. Now, here are some of the problems and why this is a, a, a technological challenge. So we, if you look here, you see we want the Zabeck coefficient to be large. So we want a large value here, the Zabeck coefficient. And we want the con connectivity also to be large. Well, for the Zabeck coefficient to be large, the carrier density, that is the number of, of free electrons that we have per unit uh, volume in this bar that I showed, we want that, that number to be very small to have this high Zabeck coefficient. However, to have a high electrical conductivity, we want the, that same number to be very large. We can't have it at the same time. So we have to have some kind of compromise. Thermoelectricity is all about compromise. The, the quantities that we want to have large or we want small, they work against each other. So we have to have some kind of compromise. And that's what makes this an engineering field, and it makes it hard to make progress. So uh, therefore, we want a large S and we want a large sigma. But to make that happen, we compromise and we produce a large S squared sigma because in the end, S squared sigma is the outcome. So we have two competing things, and we compromise. Uh, the thermal conductivity, likewise. We would like to have a low thermal conductivity, a high electrical conductivity. But they are related to each other. If you make a, a, a high um, electrical conductivity, you will have a high thermal conductivity because the electrons carry both electricity and heat. So we've got a problem in our hands, and that's a challenge and progress is being made. 
So uh, the field got a big input impetus uh, at, at, during the World War uh, II days and right after. And there was a big uh, uh, expansion in capabilities and interest in this field. So the 1960s saw this big increase from very, very tiny values of the ZT factor uh, to a value of one. At, at that value, industry started, and people were using thermoelectrics for various small applications. That is, the space program in the United States worked entirely through this because when you put a satellite up, it's thermoelectric energy that, that propels it. So it was useful, but it had niche applications, and it was not widely used. It was used over this period from 1960 to 1990, but almost no improvement in performance. The Navy, French Navy and U.S. Navy, got on the science communities on their backs just around 1990, 92, that, that era, and then this Experiments were done increasing the value. And nowadays, uh, in niche labs report some very, very high numbers, but what can be achieved uh, generally in everybody's lab in a repeatable manner is a value of about 1.5. So this is about where we are, are now in uh, 2012. Okay, and you, uh, I have some numbers here on the side of, of different reported papers with l large values, uh, but for the most part, neither of these works have been re repeatable by other groups. So moving right along. Well, the way uh, uh, these uh, values are made here is to put a nanoparticle, so this is a nanoparticle, two, three nanometers, in uh, an environment of similar material, but something slightly different, so that there's scattering of the uh, uh, phonons, mostly the phonons, the electrons to a lesser degree, at these boundaries. That is the challenge of this whole problem, is how to have the electrons propagate while the phonons are scattered, even though the two are related. So. Uh, this is summarized in this view graph. We want a high Zabeck coefficient. We would love to have also a light, high conductivity, but they don't go together. So we have to make some kind of compromise and the same thing for um, the thermal conductivity and electrical conductivity. And the way this is done is nano. And uh, so the idea of nano uh, came about as a little story. We have many uh, people here that are not scientists. So uh, there was a dinner that I attended. I was involved with this. This is my recollection of what happened back in 1992. So the French Navy uh, uh, representative uh, gave me and another fellow in Belgium, Jean-Paul Issy, uh, a dinner invitation, come and talk to us about the possibilities of thermoelectricity. What can we do? We would love to have better thermoelectrics so we can operate our submarines. That was the, <laughs> the concept. Okay, so uh, what can we do? And at this uh, meeting, we came up with two ideas. And they actually turned out to be the right ideas, but it took a little while to develop them and implement. So the ideas we came up with to make nanostructures and to make new materials. And we didn't know which one would be better. So Jean-Paul Issy took uh, new materials and I took nanostructures. That's the way we divided the work. And actually, we, we both wound up doing both of them and helping each other. But uh, both of these ideas actually worked, and now I'm going to tell you uh, how they worked and, and kind of wrap it up. So uh, here's the idea. If most of the, of the properties of materials depend on what we call the density of electron states. So the density of electron states in bulk materials has this kind of a, a shape, form. 
Now this is a normal three-dimensional material. Uh, what we would like to have is something that's very spiky and resonant right near the Fermi level. It's at that point that uh, is the de demarcation between the occupied states and the un unoccupied states. So uh, when we get down to two-dimensional two materials, that was our first idea, uh, we have something in this step form. That's already a big improvement for thermoelectricity. But if you can make quantum wires like this, this looks even better. You could see very spiky things. And this is molecules that, that's not going to make it because it's very hard to connect, connect one thing to another. So wires looks pretty good. And, uh, and maybe the two-dimensional things. So that, those are the areas that we started working with in the 90s. And those are the things that developed and are used today. So if you go to a conference on thermoelectrics nowadays, most of the talks are about nano. They use nano, but now e almost everybody's using nano, and we have to go beyond nano. So I'm going to first show you what nano did uh, in a few view graphs, and then tell you uh, what happened beyond. So uh, this shows you what, how the thermal conductivity could really be reduced by or many orders of magnitude. This is a silicon nanowire depending on what the, the uh, diameter of the nanowire uh, is, uh, you can uh, bring down the thermal conductivity uh, by uh, uh, very, very much. So, uh, uh, so th this is what you have in the bulk, and this is a logarithmic plot. So it's a factor of 10 for each tick, factor of 10, and you can see going down by many, or, or, many orders of magnitude. Here's room temperature, maybe that's where you want to look. So um, this is the first concept, and I'll show you a whole bunch of re results in very rapid order about how boundary scattering, that's the first thing that we worked on um, in the community, and it's been quite effective. So um, recent advances, I call that, yes. Uh, Bringing down the figure of Barrett here, uh, this is kind of a summary of many materials. So going from bulk to nano, so let's take a, a given material. So let's take, for example, uh, 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 bulk, uh, uh, here's n-type silicon germanium. And uh, then I want to go to nano, so nano is here. Then take bulk. Uh, uh, this is, should be p-type, one, one is n is and one is p-type. Go from here down to here. In each case, you go down almost an order of magnitude by going nano. So this is collective. And this is kind of a theory that, that a student did. This is a PhD thesis. But he did a lot more things, of course, but this is one paper that, that really had an impression of me. I learned a lot from students. And what he showed me is that independent of, of the shape and the, and, and the size sometimes, it, it's the uh, uh, interface density. The amount of, of, of uh, scattering is controlled by how much interface the carriers uh, see as they move uh, through the material. So we want to have the in interface of density uh, uh, as large as we can. So uh, that was done and it it, it obviously, uh, uh, this is experimental data here, so it works. Um, the next idea, that was done in a laboratory on, on single samples, but single samples don't cool big ovens and, or in automobiles, so we have to have a massive amount. So how do we make massive amounts? So here's an idea. You can put particles in, in some kind of surrounding medium, and that's one thing that we do. Or we could take material A and material B and grind it up so that the, between them they have a lot of interfaces. And that one works uh, also very well. But this one here works much better on a commercial basis. So now there are companies that are doing this and making it available to the auto industry. 